Okay. Oh, okay, really? On Saturday? Okay. Okay. Uh, while the children are headed downstairs, again, we didn't have our regular sound folks here tonight, so we're, uh, I think we're live now. Uh, I want you to take your Bibles, uh, if you will, tonight and turn to the book of 2 Samuel. Uh, we've spent a lot of time here over the last couple of uh, uh, weeks uh, in the book of Samuel, and uh, I want you to turn to 2 Samuel, if you will, chapter number 4. 2 Samuel chapter number 4. Good to be in the house of the Lord tonight. Amen. And I can't hear you. Is it good to be in the house of the Lord? Amen. Amen. Uh, 2 Samuel chapter number 4. Uh, we've been looking at the life of David. We've preached a couple of different messages on different events in his life uh, from the giant slayer uh, all the way up to uh, him uh, uh, being uh, pursued by Saul. Uh, we've touched on uh, the, uh, his uh, encounter, if you will, with Bathsheba. But I want to preach something a little different tonight, and uh, I hope that this will bless you and bless my heart. 2 Samuel chapter number 4. I want to look at verse number 4. 2 Samuel chapter 4, verse number 4. The Bible says, And Jonathan, Saul's son, had a son that was lame at his feet. He was five years old when the tidings came of Saul and Jonathan out of Jezreel, and his nurse took him up and fled, and it came to pass, as she made haste to flee, that he fell and became lame. And his name was Meshiba, uh, excuse me, Mephibosheth. Mephibosheth. Now, I'm going to stop right there. Uh, we're going to get into some more scripture here in just a minute. Try to say that word real fast five times, if you will. Uh, but I want to give you a little background of what's going on here. Saul, the, the king, uh, Jonathan, his son, is now dead. All right? And Jonathan had a son. And at this point uh, in the book of 2 Samuel, Jonathan's son is five years old. When word came that Jonathan and his grandfather, the king, king Saul, uh, had passed, uh, there was fear that set in in the family of Saul. And so what happened was, was uh, Mephibosheth had a nurse who decided that, hey, you're going to be in danger. So what she, what she planned to do was she was just going to grab him and take off. They were going to head for the hills. So she picks up this five-year-old, and she tries to run, and when she takes off running, apparently she dropped him a pretty great distance, which maimed, uh, made him crippled for life. And I want to talk to you just about this boy. Eventually, of course, he'll become a man. But I want to tie that into our lives as Christians. And I want to show you a comparison tonight as I preach this message, a seat at the king's table. A seat at the king's table. Now, before I got called to preach and before I was married, uh, I can remember going to homecomings at some different churches. And uh, so I remember one time that I had went to a church just the week before, was not a member there, and they announced homecoming, and they were telling people uh, that you needed to get signed up to bring something. Well, I knew that I was going to be there. Uh, Taylor was small at the time. And, you know, I'm, I'm a single uh, a father here, and uh, so I was trying to think of, okay, well, what can I make and bring? I, I'm not, a, you know, the best cook in the world, didn't have a lot of groceries in the house. So I went home, and I started looking through and everything. And one thing I found, Miss Marsha, I found a jar of dill pickles. Now, some of you laugh at that, but I, listen, I've seen people come into fellowship building with, with all kinds of stuff. So dill pickles apparently is not off limits. 
So I, I remember getting the dill pickles, and I was thinking, well, I won't have to cook. Uh, and I know this seems kind of meager, if you will, but I didn't have a whole lot. And I figured somebody's going to make macaroni and all that kind of stuff. And I can make macaroni pretty good, and I can open a can of tuna fish pretty good. But uh, I figured these dill pickles, and I remember getting that, and I took, I think it was a, a little bag of cookies or something. So I walked in on that morning, and I felt like a pauper, I'll be honest with you. Everybody walked in the door, and they were carrying their, uh, you know, the dishes of what they had made, and, you know, hams and chicken and this and that and everything, and I was trying to sneak my dill pickles and my cookies in the fellowship building. And I remember walking in, and I sat them down, hoping nobody paid attention, and I, but I felt like I was doing my part, right? Now, here's the thing, though. When the service was over, I went over to the fellowship building. They said, uh, Tim, are you going to stay? And I said, yes. And uh, remember, we walked over to the fellowship building, and I went over, and it was funny because I was a visitor, and they, the, the preacher said, allow the visitors to go first. And so we went up at the front of the line, and Miss Marcia, uh, I didn't even get a dill pickle or one of the cookies that I took, but I got a lot of chicken and ham and mashed potatoes and green beans and you name it, and I mean, I had a plate piled high. The moral of this story was, was that I went in as a pauper, but I ate like a king. I went in like a pauper, but I ate like a king. And I got to thinking about that when I was putting this message together, a seat at the king's table, and I hope this will bless you. So we know that Saul had a son. His name was Jonathan. And we know that Jonathan and David were what? They were like this. They were like best friends, brothers. I mean, there was a bond that they had. And, 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 and it's ironic that Jonathan's dad was the one chasing David, trying to kill him. And, uh, but so there was this bond, this friendship. And the Bible says that Jonathan had a son named uh, Mephibosheth, who was five, and the news came. And, of course, I told you about the nurse dropping him, and he was crippled from that moment on. But King David, there comes a time, and we'll talk about this in a few minutes, and I'll kind of get you up to speed. But King David one day, he's, he's the king, and he walks out on his balcony again. You know, he's had, he's had some problems on his balcony. But he walks out on his balcony, and he's overlooking his kingdom, and he's thinking to himself, you know, God has blessed me, blessed me richly, and I've got all these servants, and I've got this land and this nation, and, you know, uh, you know, I've got all this going for me and everything. And he starts to remember his friend, Jonathan. And uh, so what he does, he asks Ziba, who was Saul's trusted servant, all right? Ziba is now serving, uh, 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 if you will, David, but still has ties to uh, Saul's family and so on and so forth. But he goes to Ziba and he says, listen, he says, is there anybody else left in King Saul's family? Anybody? And he says, because I want to extend grace. Now, even though Saul tried to kill David, he said, no, you know, he's gone on. He says, but I want to extend some grace to this family. He says, is there anybody out there? And so Ziba uh, answers the king by telling of Mephibosheth, the crippled son of Jonathan. And so David then asks, he says, well, where can I find him? And so Ziba gives the whereabouts. And then King David, remember I told you I preached on this the other day, he was very good at sending, remember? Remember all the different times he sent in that chapter? Well, this time he sends again. And he sends his servants and he says, listen, he says, I want you to go and I want you to bring Mephibosheth to me. So they go out and they find him and they pick him up because he can't walk and they bring him in before the king. Now I imagine Mephibosheth was very scared. Now this has been this is later on. The years have been by, went by since all of this has taken place uh, with him being crippled. So he's, he's, he's grown now. And they bring him up before David and surely he's got to be nervous because he's thinking, you know, uh, my grandfather tried to kill the king. And all these attempts, and, and surely he's probably thinking that he is going to do lash out some kind of punishment against him or the rest of his family. And so they bring him before King David, and they set him down before him. And um, King David is very, very gracious, and he's very kind. And he looks at Mephibosheth, who says, King, I'm here. He says, I'm your servant, which is what anybody in their right mind would do. Remember Bathsheba when she was uh, uh, brought before David? What did, that was her considered her lord, her king, and so she was willing to do whatever because there were consequences. And Mephibosheth was in the same situation. And so he sets him down in front, they set him in front of David, and David said, listen, I'm going to do this for you. He says, I'm going to give you back all of the land that your grandfather ever owned. Now you, he's thinking, what? He said, I'm going to give it all back to you. 
He says, I'm going to extend grace. I'm going to give it all back to you. He says, and then he says, not only that, but from here on out, you're always going to eat at the king's table. How about that? You're always going to eat at my table. Now, I'm sure that Mephibosheth was taken uh, off balance with this, and, but I got to thinking about that. And that's where I was getting the title, A Seat at the King's Table. So Mephibosheth bows again and tells David, he says, look, I'm your servant. He says, and I appreciate everything that you're doing. He says, but I'm no better than a dead dog in front of you. You know what he was referring to? He was referring to his circumstance. He says, I'm no use to you. He says, I've got, I, I can't walk. I've been crippled since I've been five years old. What can I do? And here you are giving me back my grandfather's land, and you're telling me that I will eat at your table. He says, I'm unworthy of that. And then David calls in Ziba and tells him what he's done. And then he tells Ziba, he says this. He says, what I'm going to do, he says, I want you to let everybody know, the servants, you, everybody, he says, y'all are going to farm the land uh, and harvest the crops, but uh, Mephibosheth will always eat at my table. So now Mephibosheth, he's getting all the land back. Now he's got an army of people that are going to be working the crops and taking care of it and everything. And David is extending grace, and he said, but you'll always eat at the king's table. And so the Bible tells us that Mephibosheth ate at the king's table as if he were one of David's own sons. I want you to turn your Bibles, if you will, to chapter number 9 now. Now, I gave you the, I gave you the uh, kind of the gist there just a little bit. Look at verse 3. The Bible says, And the king said, Is there not yet any of the house of Saul? that I may show the kindness of God unto him. And Ziba said unto the king, Jonathan hath a son which is lame on his feet. The king said unto him, Where is he? And Ziba said unto the king, Behold, he's in the house of Mashur. He said, The son of Amiel uh, in Lodabar. Then king David sent and fetched him out of the house of Mashur, the son of Amiel, from Lodabar. Now when Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, was coming to David, he fell on his face and did, listen to this, reverence. And David said, Mephibosheth, and he answered, Behold thy servant. And David said unto him, Fear not, for I will surely show thee the kindness for Jonathan thy father's sake, and will restore thee all the land of Saul thy father, and thou shalt eat bread at my table continually. And he bowed himself and said, What is the, uh, he says, Why is thy ser- or excuse me, what is thy servant that thou should have looked upon such uh, a dead dog as I am? Then the king uh, called to Ziba, Saul's servant, and said unto him, I have given unto the master's son all that pertained to Saul and to all his house. Thou therefore and thy sons and thy servants, they shall uh, till the land for him and shall bring in thy fruits that the master's son may have food to eat. But Mephibosheth, thy master's son, shall eat bread always at my table. Now Ziba had 15 sons and 20, and, excuse me, and 20 servants. Then said Ziba unto the king, according to all that my lord the king hath commanded his servant, so shall thy servant do. As for Mephibosheth, said the king, he shall eat at my table as one of the king's sons. Father, in Jesus' name we come to you, Father. Father, I'm thankful tonight that I'm one of your sons, Lord. Father, Lord, I'm thankful tonight, Lord, that we that are saved are adopted into the family of God. And Father, I'm thankful, Lord, for that grace, Lord, and that mercy that you showed upon me, Father. And God, I pray tonight, Lord, as we preach this message, oh, Lord, give liberty. And God, I pray you just hide me, Lord, behind that blood-stained banner, Lord. Let's wave it tonight, Lord. Share the gospel, Father. Lord, I pray, God, that one person would get touched by the message tonight. It would mean the world. Father, I pray, God, that somebody's life might be changed. Father, we love you and we bless you. Be with us now in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Listen, remember I talked about homecoming just a few minutes ago. Uh, If the Apostle Paul was to write about uh, my meager experience of bringing some pickles and some uh, cookies uh, to homecoming, uh, uh, he definitely would have used some symbolism. He could have related my story to this story. This is exactly what the Lord Jesus Christ does for us that are seeking a relationship with Him. It isn't about what we bring to the table. Listen to me again. It's not about what you bring to the table of the Master. It is about your hunger. It is all about your hunger. Let me tell you something. The Bible says, Blessed are they which do what? Hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be what? Filled. So if you come to the master's table and you're hungry, listen, when you walk into the door of the church, you can come in here and you can dine. If you're hungry, there's something here to feed you. But that's all on you. It is your desire. How how strong is your desire to eat at the master's table tonight? And so uh, Romans 5.8 is a reminder to me when I was putting the message together 
that as bad as we are, Jesus died for all of us, and God showed tremendous love for all of us through his son Jesus Christ. And I was reminded of that. But God commendeth his love for, you, for us, and while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Now, that's one of my favorite verses. Uh, a lot of times if I send out an email, that's what I've got attached to my emails or my text messages. And that, that's one of my all-time favorite because of, because of as wicked as I was and as, and as bad and awful as we are as, as, as sinners and human beings, Jesus still went to the cross knowing who we were. And so that means a lot to me. That makes that relationship personal tonight. And it reminds me that I was unable to help myself. It reminds me of every single one of us live, uh, sitting here tonight that, are, uh, uh, that were living against God. When you were out in the world and you were drinking and you were partying and you were uh, you know, neglecting God and thumbing your nose at God and in and out of relationships and fornication and adultery and drugs and whatever, whatever, whatever. And even for those that never even went through any of that but just was separated from God by the sin that Adam, uh, that, uh, that, that Adam in the fall created Listen, we all, listen, have to understand something tonight, that we were God's enemies, and yet he still sent his son to die on the cross for us. God sent his son to die for his enemies. So let me tell you something tonight. When Jesus died on the cross, God made a covenant right there to adopt you into the family of God when you would accept Christ as your Savior. You got your adoption papers. Now, that might not mean a whole lot to you sitting here tonight, but it does to me. Because that tells me that, you know what, when God looks at me, all these folks running around saying, oh, I'm a sinner saved by grace. Yes, we are. But listen, if you walk around for the rest of your life telling everybody, well, I'm just a sinner saved by grace, like that song goes, you know what you're doing? You're diminishing exactly your standing with God. Because the Bible says when God looks at you, he looks at you through who? His son, Jesus Christ. He don't look at you through sin. He doesn't look at you as a, just a sinner saved by grace. He looks at you as the righteousness of Christ. So remember that tonight. The next time, you know, it's cliche. People use that a lot of times, but that's not how God looks at us. So we've been adopted. And after we're saved and we're adopted into his family, listen, he does not invalidate the adoption because of our rebellion or worldly living. Now let's think about this. You take a kid, you know, we were going to try to help with that child here at the church, and Taylor was thinking about, you know, taking him in, and they weren't even going to adopt him. They were just going to let him stay there. One of her questions was, is what happens if he gets back to the house and he goes crazy? And who knows, maybe he turns into Chucky or something and grabs a knife and chases her through the kitchen. I mean, you don't know what's going to happen, right? Uh, kids have problems and things. But here's the thing. If you go out to adopt a child from an ad adoption agency, you don't know what you're getting. Now, they can tell you anything about, oh, he's sweet, she's sweet, this, that, but you don't know the extent of their problem. So maybe the child was abused, maybe they've been through a lot of, you know, things, maybe they got psychological issues, whatever. But here's the thing tonight. Once you adopt that child, right, that child belongs to who? It belongs to you. Now, you can't just run back out and say right after the adoption, when that child starts acting up, and say, whoa, I, I bit off more than I can chew. I need to, I need, hey, hey, well, I didn't read the fine print. I mean, what's the refund policy here? You know, I mean, what's the return? Can I exchange him? I mean, if, if I can't get my money back, I can't invalidate the adoption, can I, can I swap him out? And, and, but boy, ain't you glad tonight that, listen, listen, no matter what we do after we're saved, no, listen, it does not matter what you do after you get saved, God will never invalidate that adoption. That's good stuff. I'm not telling you to run out here and sin, but I'm telling you that, listen, he is not going to invalidate it. You belong to him. All right? Uh, you belong to him. And, and, and as the Bible tells us that, listen, we are sealed until the day of redemption, that is that seal on that adoption paper. You belong to the king. And so tonight, I want to give you some encouragement with that. But listen, it's one thing, and it's easy to love a child that's obedient. I mean, it's easy. If your child does good, they're doing good in school, they listen, uh, you know, at home, uh, they're, they don't cause you any problems and all that. Man, that's easy being a parent. I mean, he's had that. I mean, but, but, but you know what I'm saying. But then all of a sudden, you know, they get a little older and their mouths change. You know, they all sweet and everything. And then all of a sudden, boy, they start talking some kind of foreign language, back talking and stuff, acting like they're at the Tower of Babel or something here in modern day 2022 and flap, flapping their gums and lips and tongue and all that kind of stuff. And you're like, whoa, where'd that language come from? All of a sudden, guess what? That obedience that was all nice and everything and so easy to raise a kid, it ain't, it ain't that easy no more. But what do we do? Do we say, well, Lord, listen, they were good for the first 12 years, but now these teenage years, I don't know who this is. 
I mean, this is like Satan in Junior's body here. I, I don't know what's going on here. What, what do we do? Do we say, Lord, will you take my child? No, we don't. What do we do? We still love them. Matter of fact, we love them more. We try to help them through what they're going through and everything. They cause us hurt and problems and everything. But you know what? I'm still going to be the dad. And that's how our father is. We cause him hurt and grief and pain, the way that we live, the things that we do, and yet still what? He loves us. Boy, I thank God for that tonight. Amen. So the test of love is unconditional love, even when we're unlovable. And everybody in here at some point has been unlovable. If you say you got the perfect marriage, you're telling one. Amen. I don't know anybody that has a perfect marriage. Uh, you can be all in love and everything, and then all of a sudden you can forget it for about 30 minutes when your spouse starts saying something or they won't be quiet and they want to keep arguing and all that kind of stuff. And, boy, your blood pressure starts building up, and it's all of a sudden you don't, you don't remember the woman in the wedding dress that you're carrying over the threshold, right? All you see is a boxing gloves and an octagon that you want to get in, right? I mean, y'all know what I'm talking about, right? It's hard sometimes. But listen, when we love someone, we don't stop loving people because of something that they do. And, 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 but in this, in this age we live in, people do it all the time. But I'm thankful that God doesn't just say, you know what, I've had enough of you. I'm done with you, and I'm not going to love you anymore. It's unconditional love. So in Romans 5, 8, God certainly passed the test of unconditional love by sending Christ to die on the cross for us. So the ladies, listen, the ladies of the church have never told anyone that walks, as far as I know, I've never heard it. I'm sure I would, though. If anyone walks into the fellowship building carrying pickles like I did and a, and a bag of cookies to come back, take it home and come back when they learn to cook. I've never heard that. Now, you might think that. I've never heard it. I'm sure it will come down the pike, though. But I don't think anybody's ever been turned away because you didn't bake a chicken or bake a ham or something like that. And the reason I was thinking about that is because of this. Listen, God never said to us that he would die for us when we deserved it because we never could. In other words, when Jesus went to the cross and he looked through history, he looked through time and he saw us, he was like, wait a minute, hold on, whoa, 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 stop the press. Before, I'm not getting on that cross because I just looked through and I saw Sherry and she's going to commit a sin. She's going to be awful. Brenda's going to do something. Nancy's going to do something. Whatever, whatever. Look, Father, I'll go through it when they can learn how to be deserving. Well, I'm thank God he didn't do that. That's the same thing. We can relate that to the fellowship building. We don't turn people away just because maybe they, they do something a little different than us or something, uh, you know, we expect something of them or whatever. And I'm thankful that God doesn't turn us away either. And so neither did David. And when we look at Mephibosheth's life, we say, uh, listen, I, uh, David didn't say this. David didn't say, listen, they said, listen, he's got a son and the son's crippled. David didn't say, wait a minute, can we, can, we, can we roll the dice again and see if he's got another son? Uh, can we make this a little bit easier? Does he have a daughter? I mean, does he have, have what about a nephew? What about a great, you know, he didn't run through all the, all the, uh, the family tree of, of Saul and Jonathan when he found out that Mephibosheth was crippled. He didn't do that, right? He, he said, bring him to me. And he knew everything about him. God knows everything about us tonight. Amen. When Jesus went to the cross, listen, the Bible says that he would draw all men. He said, if I be lifted up, I'll draw all men unto me. Listen, when that cross was lifted up, he seen every one of us. He didn't say, lay me back down because I know how wicked they are. Boy, aren't you thankful for that tonight? Uh, so in the story here, David already knew about Mephibosheth. But he said, bring him to me. He says, that's not going to hinder anything. And so... Here's kind of interesting thing. So I went back and I was looking through the Word of God, and all we know about this fella is we know his name, we know his calamity, we know he was dropped by his nurse, and we know he's got a disability, that he can't walk, but that's about all we know. We know that he's living somewhere else, but that's it. Doesn't tell anything, doesn't tell anything from the time he fell to the time David called for him. We don't know where he's at, what he's doing, anything about him. But see, David, um, he calls for him. And if David was intent on killing the heirs of Saul, if you think about it, Mephibosheth would have been the first one to die. You know why? Because he would have been the heir to what? He would have been the heir to the throne. So he'd have been the first one. So obviously, uh, David was not looking for that reason. And, and so the family, they're fleeing for their safety, and she drops him, 
and he's crippled, and I imagine he became a hardship to the nurse. I imagine he was a hardship wherever he grew up because he constantly had to be helped around and taken care of and things like that. I was reading, I can't imagine, I was reading an article today that um, a family was awarded, I think it was in Houston, they were awarded... tibia fracture, and he went in to have the fracture uh, uh, operation, have the fracture, uh, uh, I don't know what, the, what, what exactly what they were doing, but whatever uh, equipment they were using or, or whatever, uh, he developed, uh, what do you call that, Encep uh, encephalitis or whatever, something because anesthesia, the doctor had, was running between five rooms, and he didn't get enough oxygen to his brain. If you know that you don't get enough oxygen in your blood to your brain, guess what? You can die. Well, he's a vegetable now. A routine surgery told his mom, hey, don't worry, two hours, I'll be out, everything's good, and he's a vegetable, and they're having to take care of him, and they've been doing this for a long time, and he was awarded this big amount of money. Can you imagine that being someone in your family, especially a husband or a wife? I've done told Cherry, I'm like, look, if something happens like that to me, put me in the building, the bonus room, something, but you better be taking care of me. I mean, you know, and, and, and we say that, you know, pray enough, it never happens, but can you imagine, even me saying that kidding with her, I'm thinking, man, can you imagine how hard that would be to have to take care of somebody to, make, you know, eating and bathing and moving and they can't do anything. So this man right here was in a, in a bad position and he required a lot of help. And so when I read this story, I can't help but think of me and other people here tonight. See, we have a lot of, in common with Mephibosheth. See, we were born in a, in, a, in a line of royalty, if you think about it, all right? And we carry the wounds of a fall. Adam dropped us, if you will. Adam and Eve dropped us. They dropped the ball in the Garden of Eden. And because of their fall, guess what? Not only they were affected, but all of humanity has been affected. And each of us have lived in fear. If you're not saved, or if you're saved tonight, we've all lived in the fear of a king that we've never met. Mephibosheth had never met David. People here, you've never physically met Lord Jesus Christ. Now, we accept him in our, our life, our heart, we turn from our sin, you know, we get born again, uh, but here's the thing. We live in fear because the Bible tells us that we're supposed to do what? Fear God, right? And so we live in fear of the king because if you're here tonight and you're living lost, you better have fear because he's going to be your judge. If you're here tonight and you're saved and you're a carnal Christian, you better have fear because he's still going to be your judge. And, and so... There is fear because one day you will stand before the Lord and he will be your judge. He will be your king. And you've never been in that position before. You've walked around the earth. You've made decisions. You were talking about a young lady that's supposed to be here tonight. She doesn't show up, whatever. Uh, things are going on. People neglect. Uh, you know, I, I, it reminds me of, of, of the verse, you know, how we neglect such great a salvation. Not only that, but how do people neglect God coming to God's house, worshiping him. How do we do that? I just don't get it. And so tonight we're reminded that our king is also our judge. And one day, listen, if we're smart, we all should live in fear. Not that he's going to zap us and make us fall over dead, but we should fear him out of a loving fear, a respectful fear of who he is. And, and so, listen, we've got a lot in common uh, with the son here. So, for nearly two decades, as I was reading and studying, this young prince, if you will, I mean, he was in line. He lived in a distant land. He was unable to walk to the king. He was too fearful to talk to the king, and he was unable to help himself. Boy, who does that sound like? That sounds just like us. See, when sin separated us from God, that's exactly who we were. We can put our name in there. And this right here is, this is, this is an analogy to us uh, as uh, it relates to the Lord Jesus Christ, our King. So, but there was a promise made in the story, and you say, well, why was David doing everything that he did for Mephibosheth? Well, let me tell you. Some of you know the story. Some of you probably maybe never read the story, but it's interesting. Uh, David and Jonathan, as they were close friends, the Bible says in 1 Sam Samuel chapter 20, tells us that Jonathan loved David as much as he loved himself. Now, that's a lot of love then, now, today, that would be a lot of love because there's a lot of people in love with themselves, themselves amen, in 2022. 
I, I mean, mean, almost to the point of it's sickening how people are in love with themselves. Uh, but the Bible says he loved him as much as he loved himself. And so when David learned that Saul was trying to kill him, his friend, Jonathan, now remember, who was Saul? That's his who? That's Jonathan's dad, right? Which would be Mephibosheth's grandfather. But when, when David found this out, he goes and he's talking to Jonathan about his own father. And you would think that Jonathan would be, hey, that's the king. He's my father. I'm sticking up from him, whatever. But you know what? He has such loyalty to his friendship with David, they made an agreement. And honestly, I don't even think that, I think the agreement, even if one of them had not decided to do, I believe the other one who made the promise would have stuck with their promise. And here's what I mean. So Saul's son made a pledge to save David's life. And he asked for one favor in return, and that was that David would never stop showing kindness to his family. David looks at him, and Jonathan says, I'm going to protect you. I'm going to get you away from my crazy daddy. He says, I'm going to hide you. I'm going to do whatever it takes. He says, but could you make me a promise, too, that you never? Because you know what? See, he knew that David was the next king. He knew that David was still on the throne. He knew that David was going to have all this power uh, and everything. And he says, look, he says, if you could just show kindness. Why would he want kindness for his family? Well, think about it. He's got a son now. Right? You would want somebody to show. You wouldn't want somebody going in just because your dad, you're guilty by association just because your dad is a murderer doesn't mean you're a murderer. And, and you don't want people to think, you know, bad about you because somebody, something you and your family did and take it out on them. And that's what was going on. And now we know the back end of the story. He's got a son here. So he says, let's make this agreement. And they do. They promise each other this, this kindness. And so now we fast forward to where we started. David, he's outside. He's looking. He's thinking. And then all of a sudden, he's like, you know what, Lord, you bless me so much. But you know, now that I remember something, I remember Jonathan. If it hadn't have been for my friend Jonathan, I wouldn't be standing here tonight. How many of us can say that? I can say that. Man, if it hadn't been for somebody praying for me, if it hadn't been somebody standing in the gap for me, I'm, I might not be standing here tonight. And so that's exactly what David was going through. His thoughts went back to his friend Jonathan. And so he comes into a time of remembrance. So people who are prone to extend grace, listen, we all, we kind of ask, we, we kind of ask this question. Um, how many of us tonight, how many of us here tonight extend grace because it's something natural? It's something, I mean, you just feel in your heart that, look, I want to help somebody. I, I, want, I really want to make a difference because when I was younger, I didn't have these things. And I always said when I had a child that my child, I said, I'm going to treat my child, but she, she or he's going to be spoiled, rotten. Uh, you know, they're never going to do anything wrong in my eyes, blah, 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 blah. And I'm going to give my child everything that I can give them, even if it means that I'm not happy. I will sacrifice my happiness for my child because of the way that I felt like I missed out being a child. And so... And I did, and she's turned out great, and uh, she's spoiled and all that good stuff, but uh, she can tell you on a half of a hand how many times she was spanked, and uh, probably on a half of a tip of her pinky, uh, yeah, I think once in her whole life. But anyway, but the point I'm trying to make here is this. I did that for her because I loved her. It was totally unconditional. It was grace that I extended to her. But I didn't do it so that I could stand here 20, almost 22 years later and say, look what I did for her. Let's put it on the billboard out here. I want everybody to know, uh, uh, to make me look good, I'm, you know, how many of us extend grace because we really got a good heart? Or we do extend grace because we want uh, our names up and lights about it, or we want people to talk about us and all of that. And so David here, David's heart was in the right place. I mean, he was out just thinking on the balcony. And then all of a sudden, he could have said, you know what he could have said? He could have said, look what I've done. Man, who would have, man, I went from a shepherd boy to killing a, a giant to doing this, and man, I, I, I stole the, uh, Uriah's wife and, and all of this, and I've had everything I wanted. I'm the most powerful person. Ain't nobody can touch me, and man, I did it all myself. But he didn't do that, did he? walked out on the balcony and said, you know what? If it hadn't been for my good friend, I probably wouldn't be standing here. And so he extends grace. And, and so I want you to understand something here tonight. Listen. There are people out here that do things for applause and a show. 
There's people out here that don't do any, that don't do things because their hearts aren't genuine. But David, he was once weak himself, remember? And he was helped. Saul chased him and wanted to kill him, and David was afraid. So David is he's used to being in a, in a, in a place of weakness, just like Mephibosheth was. So maybe, maybe David got a little bit more than he bargained for. He could have surely asked if there were other options, but he didn't. And look at his response in verse number four, if you will. I want to go back uh, to where we were at just a minute. If you'll turn back uh, to, uh, let me get my place here. Turn back to chapter four and look at verse number four. Second Samuel chapter four, verse number four. I found this interesting when I was studying. The Bible says, and Jonathan's, and Jonathan's saw son had a son that was lame of his feet. He was five years old when Tidy came and saw Jonathan out of Jezreel. And his nurse took him up and fled. And it came to pass that she made haste to flee, that he fell and became lame, and his name was Mephibosheth. Now, David, if you go in and you look at, the, and you, you, you read the rest of the story here uh, from that point, David, what does he do here? David does something. He asks, he says, where is this son? Where is this son? That's what God's asking tonight. The king is asking tonight, where is my son? For those of you that are out in the world, those of you that are carnal, those of you that are not walking in, in, in the light of Christ, those of you that are out here that, are, that you find yourself uh, uh, just you know, enjoying worldly pleasures and this, that, and the other, listen, I can get up here and preach to you and tell you how God's judgment is going to fall on you and this, that, and the other, but here's the thing. Even though God is a judge and you deserve it, He also loves you and He wants you back. Just like a prodigal son, He wants you back. Where is my son? Where is my daughter? And that's exactly what David was asking here. He says, where is he at? And it makes you wonder how long it had been since Mephibosheth had heard himself called or referred to as a son. He probably didn't have a lot of friends. He probably, wherever he was saying, he probably never heard the word son. I mean, his grandfather's gone. His father's gone. He's not heard those kind of words. And then David, he never says, hey, where's this problem child? Where's this cripple at? Where's this guy who's lame or maim? Or, where, where's he at? He didn't say that. He said, where's the son? And that's what God says to us tonight. Where's my son? See, there's people in this church tonight like, you've carried the stigma your whole life. And if you haven't, there's a good chance that at some point you will. We all have. Conversation like this. Have you talked to Mike lately? No, I ain't talked to him. I wonder if he's still changing jobs. What's the stigma? Mike is not very uh, reliable. Mike's changing jobs all the time. Mike's not, uh, he's not very responsible. Hey, we got a letter from Mary, you know, the drug addict. What's the stigma? She's a drug addict. Wonder if Mary's still doing drugs. Wonder if Mary's got a stigma. If I mention my sister, the first thing people think of is crack cocaine. If I mention my brother Mike, most people think about heroin and a con artist and everything. I mean, we can go on and on and even before I got saved, you know, living loose and, 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 and running hard and doing all this kind of stuff. Everybody in your past has got a stigma. What about the girl that shows up in the church that walks in and she looks like she's eight or nine months pregnant? And we got we always got nosy people in the church. So, and I, I got one in particular, Lord forgive me, their face just popped up like a billboard in my head. Luckily, they're not here tonight. But somebody would walk up and be like, well, how far along are you pregnant? Where's the daddy at? I could hear that coming out of somebody's mouth in this church. Lord, help us. But to think about it, what's the stigma? The stigma is, this woman's here, she's unwed, she's out here, she's probably living loose, and this, that, and the other, and she's got a baby, and she don't have a baby, there's no baby daddy around, and all that kind of thing. A stigma, we've all had stigmas. But David never uses the stigma on Mephibosheth. See, your past tonight, I've learned, is like a younger sibling. When I was growing up, I was always, I was the middle child. They always said, the youngest gets away with everything, the oldest gets to do everything, and the middle gets everything dumped on him. You get it all, and I believe that. But when I was younger, I remember my younger brother and sister would follow me around, and they would get on my nerves. Now, who would, who would ever thought that all these years later that I would be a pastor, be saved, and be helping them like I have helped them as a middle brother when my older brother wouldn't have anything to do with them? 
But it's, it's just ironic how, pe- how things change. But when they were younger, I didn't want them following me around. I mean, it's like a bad case athlete's foot. You couldn't get rid of them. And, and so you would be like, can't you go, go play? Can't you find something to do? Whatever. But you know what? I just preached the other night on David. When David got sent out to the sheep out in the field, I'm sure his brother said he's the littlest. He don't weigh nine ounces. Send him out here so we'll quit getting in the way. Get him out of our hair. I think David remembered that stigma. So is there not anyone who sees us differently than from our past mistakes? There is one, and his name's Jesus. See, it doesn't matter what, it doesn't matter what any of you in here in this church think about me. As long as I know where I stand with Jesus. See, that's all that matters. When this is all done, folks, it's not going to be about anybody's money in this church, anybody's status in this church. It's not going to, it doesn't matter who was popular in high school. By the way, I encourage everybody to go to a reunion. That's the best thing ever. <laughs> Boy, I tell you what, I'll never forget that one that I first one I went to. I had a blast. I walked in there. Some of those real pretty people back then. And I, listen, I, I'll, I'll admit, my senior year, I was on the homecoming court. I, I made it. I don't know how. Somebody must have really liked me. But but I was little. But I but but all through high school years, all these people that just get on your nerves, right? And boy, you see them out there, and man, I mean, one girl was out there, and she had like six kids, and they didn't even, they didn't even have anybody watching the kids. She thought they had a daycare on site, right? And then you have these other, you know, the homecoming queen, and whoo-hoo, man, boy, time, time sure does do a number on us, don't it? And uh, y'all know what I'm talking about. And, but it was funny, all these people who thought they had it all, and they had their yearbooks, you know, going to be the most popular, and they're the most this and that and the other, and their lives turn out totally different than what they ever dreamed of. So here's the thing. It does not matter what people think about us. It only matters what God sees in us. Always remember that. Just remember that. I think that will help some of you tonight. And so Mephibosheth, he's carried this stigma, according to my calculation when I was reading this, for about 20 years or so. And when people spoke of him, you know how they spoke of him? Of his problems. Mephibosheth, the cripple, the guy that has no legs. He's got one leg longer than the other, and they call him Eileen. Some of you get that in a minute. That was a joke somebody told one time. Uh, but see, that's, that's, the, that's the stuff that people, some of you are getting it now. You're like, hey, that's pretty good. Preacher's funny every now and then. But here's the thing. We used to use those jokes in school. You couldn't say that in school now. You'd be suspended for the whole year. And they send you, if you was in the seventh grade, they'd put you back in the first grade in this crazy way that we're living now. But here's the thing, though. All the jokes were made about him. All the people made fun of him. How many of y'all have a stigma today when they refer to you? Do they call you something other than your name? Anybody got a stigma? Think about it. Some of them are good. Some of them are not so good. But the king called him son. The king that he had never met called him a son. When Mephibosheth was carried into David's presence, he was afraid and he... He exhibits exactly how we ought to be in front of a holy and righteous God. You ought to be afraid. Now, but David's first words, this was said by Jesus so many times, said by God so many times. Go through your Bible and see how many times the words, be not afraid. That's exactly what David said to him. Be not afraid. Be not afraid. And so the most repeated command from the lips of our Savior was be not afraid. The king tonight is telling everybody here, be not afraid. See, Mephibosheth, he called, he found, and he was rescued. But you know what? He still needed some assurance. And I'm thankful for blessed assurance tonight. See, there's people here tonight that need some assurance. I was thinking about this earlier. Before Romans 5.8 was ever penned by Paul, God had sent prophets out to preach. But at this point, He had sent his son out to die. That's the message tonight. The king that would die for his enemies. See, when we're afraid, God points us to all those blood-spattered beings on that cross. And all that blood that ran down the cross, you know what it's saying? Be not afraid. Thank you, Lord. Be not afraid. And as David kept his promise to Jonathan, God will certainly keep his promises to us. You know, one thing in the Bible that I like more than any one verse 
is God cannot lie. There's a lot of liars. There's people out here that will tell a lie that didn't realize they told a lie, but they told one. But you've got some absolute people out here that will lie. Just They'll look at you and lie to your face. And you'll know it's a lie, but they're so convincing that they'll make you go and say, man, are they telling the truth? That's how convincing they are. But God can never lie. So as David's friends and family sat at the table to eat, can you imagine David's got his whole family, his family, at the table, his children, his servants, I mean, everybody that, everybody that was a, of a who's who in the kingdom is sitting at David's table. And then all of a sudden, I can imagine, and I don't know, you can hear this noise. And here comes, guess who? Mephibosheth. And boy, he's got that cane. He's got them crutches. And you hear them. And everybody's turning. What's that noise? What's that noise? What's that noise? And then all of a sudden, guess who's coming to the table? Now let me ask you a question. As he's walking his way to that table, do you think at any point Mephibosheth realized at that point what grace was? That was a picture of grace right there. Ask everybody here tonight, do you see your story in this story? Children of royalty, crippled by the fall, marred by sin, and yet the king still invites us to the table and says, from this point on, you're adopted into the family and you will sit at the king's table. There's coming a day, and it's not going to be long, folks, that we will sit with the Savior at the marriage supper of the Lamb. If you're saved and born again, you will sit at that table. But if you're lost, you still have a chance. There's still some hope out there for you tonight. If you're like me, you limp more than you walk sometimes. And yet, God is still going to say, there's your seat at the table when we get to heaven. All the mistakes I make, all the bad choices that I make, and God's still going to say, Tim, there's your seat at the table. You're my son. You've been adopted into my family. Like Mephibosheth, everybody here that's saved tonight, that's listening tonight, they're sons and daughters of the king. And if you're not, listen, the adoption process is still ongoing. It, he, he's still waiting, but you're running out of time. I want you to stand tonight, heads bowed, and eyes closed. A seat at the king's table tonight. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Mike, if you will, just on that, you hit the uh, pre uh, hit the post stream. That's 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 fine. That's fine. That's fine. We'll go ahead and we're going to close. It's fine. We'll just go ahead and close out tonight. But listen, if you've got a, if you've got anything tonight that you need prayer over, I want you to lift your hand tonight.